Welcome to the EVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of EVO. And we're delighted to have you here with us today for this fellowship lecture, um, Yiddish to the Core, Wedding Music and Jewish Identity in Post-War New York City. This is Max Weinreich Fellowship Lecture in Eastern uh, East European Arts, Music, and Theater. It's the Ruth and Joseph Kremen Memorial Fellowship, for which we're really delighted to have Uri Schroeder here with us today. Uri is an interdisciplinary musicologist, composer, keyboardist, and filmmaker. Born in Tel Aviv, he's currently pursuing his PhD in historical musicology at Harvard University. Prior to Harvard, he studied at Tel Aviv University, where he earned a BA in composition and musicology and an MA in modern European history. His current research, research project explores the politics of Jewish music during uh, the early war, early post-war period. His scholarship has been supported by the American Musicological Society, the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture, the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History, and as I mentioned, he is the recipient of the 2022-2023 Ruth and Joseph Kramen Memorial Fellowship in East European Arts, Music, and Theater here at the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. Outside of academia, Uri is a composer, a pianist, and filmmaker who has collaborated with numerous artists in Yiddish culture and beyond. So once again, Uri, welcome. Thanks so much for, for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alex, for this kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, yeah, so thanks again. It's uh, great to see you here, and thanks everyone for coming, even though I can't see you right now. Um, I'd also like to thank Ivo for their generous support of this research, and especially Eddie Portnoy for all his help throughout this past year. Uh, and also thanks to all the archivists, librarians, and staff at YIVO and the Center for Jewish History and all the partner organizations there. I spent a lot of time there this year, and you're all very, very supportive, so thank you. So um, today I'm going to talk about Jewish wedding music in New York in the early post-war period, so around the 1950s, more or less. And I want to show you just how important this music was for American Jews, what it meant for them and the intensity of emotions that it could evoke, both positive and negative emotions, and complicated emotions that reflected the diversity of American Jews and of the cultural changes they were going through during this era. And <clears throat> right off the bat, I want to start us off with a couple of anecdotes that demonstrate this emotional intensity that people felt about Jewish wedding music. And the first story comes from a journalist for the Forwards, Chaim Ehrenreich, who attended a Jewish wedding in 1957, a reform wedding, where the band played absolutely no Jewish music, which was actually very rare, as I'll show you later. And he reported back about his feelings, and this is what he said. The reform chupa, the wedding canopy, ended with a wedding dinner, not kosher, not even kosher style, and with dances, not even a single Jewish dance, no hopke, broiges, tanzscher, kadril, redlech, or polka. The band, in scare quotes, played only waltzes and jazz music. It was one of the coldest weddings I have ever had the occasion to attend. Everything was pretentious, restrained, aesthetic, but with such coldness that I never would have believed that a Jewish wedding can be so tasteless, so utterly worthless. It's been three months already since the wedding, and I still feel a chill in my heart when I think of it. So those are harsh words. Um, the second anecdote, which shows us a very different perspective, comes from one of the musicians I've interviewed for this project. This is Marty Silverstein, who has been a pianist, band leader, and contractor in the Jewish wedding music industry for over 50 years. And Marty told me about a very unusual incident at a wedding, and this is from a bit later in the 1970s, but I'm still including it here because it's such a powerful story. So, <clears throat> Before the wedding, when he met with the families, the bride made it very clear that there should be no Jewish music at her wedding under any circumstances. She was strictly against it. But then during the wedding itself, some people from the groom's side came up to the bandstand and begged him to play a hora. They said they wanted to feel some Yiddishkeit. So Marty said, listen, I'm very sorry, and he explained the situation to them. But then they called over the bride's father to discuss this matter, and they tried to persuade him, and eventually he said, you know what, just give them what they want, play some Jewish music. Essentially, he dismissed his daughter's wishes. So then the band starts to play a hora, the crowd goes wild, and everyone is dancing, but the daughter, the bride, she sees what's happening, and she's furious, and she's cursing, and she punches her fist straight through the wedding cake. Also quite harsh. And I bring you these stories 
<coughs> excuse me, just as a teaser to show you that Jewish wedding music can be beautiful, it can be fun, but for some people it can be a lot more than that, and it can reflect something very deep about how people perceive themselves as Jews and as Americans, especially during the cultural transition of the early post-war period. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of Jewish wedding music during this era, including the different kinds of music they played and the different communities of American Jews that were the main audience for this music. But the main thing I'm after today is to try and understand people's experience with this music. I want to show you what it was like to be a Jewish wedding musician in the 50s, what kind of life you had, and also what this music meant to the people who were listening and dancing to it at their weddings. And as I'll show you, Jewish wedding music became a lot more important during this period because it was a secular symbol of continuity with Jewish tradition. And so for many American Jews, especially the less observant Jews, it came to stand in for Jewishness as a whole. And it became one of the main ways for them to express their Jewish identity. And just to give you an outline of what I'll talk about, I'm going to start by describing the club date business, which is the Jewish wedding music scene and the industry around it. Then I'll give you a very, <clears throat> a very brief survey of the musical repertoire, the different kinds of music that were played at these weddings. Um, then I'll discuss the American Jewish spectrum. These are the diverse communities of American Jews in post-war New York. And I'll explain a bit of this diversity and how it related to the different musical repertoires. And finally, I'll show you how this music served as an expression of American Jewish identity. And we'll have some time for questions in the end. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about the club date business. This is the name that musicians use for the industry of live music bands for any kind of event in New York. This means weddings, bar mitzvahs, and banquets, but also meetings of social organizations, political parties, business conferences, you name it. This included Jewish events, but there were also other sectors of this industry. For instance, there were other ethnic sectors like Polish, Italian, or Greek, and also just a general unmarked Christian American market. Musicians in New York, generally speaking, worked across the industry in all the sectors and all the different kinds of events. This was also true for Jewish musicians who usually got their paychecks or most of their paychecks playing Jewish weddings and bar mitzvahs, but they certainly worked for other populations and some of them even specialized in it. The, the, <coughs> the club date business started to emerge in the first decades of the 20th century. And by the early post-war period, it was already a well-established industry with mechanisms and institutions that governed the everyday lives of musicians and also influenced the music they played. The musicians themselves were essentially freelancers for hire who would work these jobs or club dates, as they called them, several times a week, sometimes even two jobs per day on a weekend. And each job was different. Could be a different band, a different clientele, or a different kind of event that required their own special repertoire. And the musicians were expected to be skilled and flexible and to be able to play in all of these different situations, everything you see on the screen right now. To coordinate these jobs and assemble the bands from these freelance musicians, there was a whole industry of band leaders and contractors and offices who would get leads, as they called them, or requests for bookings from families, synagogues, organizations, whatever it was, and they would hire the services of individual musicians for these events. On top of that, there was also a complicated system of collaboration, let's call it, between band leaders and caterers or catering halls, where they would kind of scratch each other's backs, provide leads and exclusivity in exchange for a cut of the profit. And this was sometimes legitimate, other times half legitimate or not at all. But this was how a lot of the business was done and how musicians got to play for the people who wanted live music. Musicians could find, <clears throat> could find work by word of mouth. And after they had enough of a reputation, if it was a good reputation, work would come to them. The contractors would call them and book their services. But at the same time, New York musicians, like musicians in many other big cities around the world, also had a designated place that they could go to to find work. And this place was called the exchange floor, and it was the beating heart of the industry. It was a place where musicians could come to socialize, develop connections with band leaders and contractors, buy sheet music, and hopefully fill up their calendar with jobs for the next few days or weeks. The main exchange floor during this period, which you're seeing right now, was operated by the Musicians Union of New York City, Local 802. And it was located in the Roseland Ballroom on 52nd Street, 
which is no longer there. It was demolished in 2014, but this is what it used to look like. This was literally a dance ballroom. That's what this space was usually used for. But a couple of days a week on designated hours, they covered the hardwood floors and hundreds of musicians from New York would come to hang out for a few hours. For musicians of this generation, this place was absolutely mythical. I can't tell you how many stories I heard about it. It was huge. It had high ceilings. It was filled with smoke. And you had music professionals from every niche of the club date business spread out around the hall. So there was a corner for Jewish music, another area of Greek and Polish and a section for society orchestras, and everyone was mixing and mingling together. This was especially important for young musicians who were just starting out because this was an opportunity to meet everyone and maybe find some work. If they didn't know anyone at all, their chances were pretty slim, but if they came down to the floor in just the right time during high season when all the musicians were busy and the contractors were desperate to find players, then maybe they could catch a break. Here's what I heard about it from Ray Cohen, who was known as the Dean of Club Date Pianists, and he played with basically everyone, including five years with Frank Sinatra. But he first started out in the club date business on the Union Exchange floor, and this is what he said. I graduated high school in 1955. I joined the union, I think, in 1956. And on the union floor, you meet people, and at the busy time of year, like June, when it was really busy, the contractors didn't have enough musicians to cover all the jobs that were available and requiring live music. And that's the time when they would step out of their comfort zone and have to hire young guys who maybe somebody said, hey, try Ray Cohen, try Joe Blow. He knows a lot of tunes and you can't go too wrong with him. Somebody took a chance with you. And if you make something of that chance, you would say, hey, you know, Ray Cohen did a nice job for me. And musicians talk to each other. In theory, since the floor was operated by the union, everyone was supposed to be card carrying union members and work according to union regulations. But of course, this wasn't always the case. And the union was never really able to enforce its policies. There's a complicated history of labor, stru labor struggles there that I'm not gonna get into right now, but I do wanna show you this document, <clears throat> which is the only one I was able to find so far. Everyone seems to have thrown them out. Um, this is a receipt for a job by Leon Schwartz, one of the most important klezmer violinists in New York and a very influential member of the klezmer community in the 20th century. So as you can see here, Leon played a job at the Young Israel of Sunnyside. Uh, this is an Orthodox synagogue in Queens. It's still there today. And I have no idea what kind of event it was, but most likely it was either a wedding or a bar mitzvah of someone in the community. He played in late December 1957 and was paid a couple of weeks later in January 1958. So not so bad. And this receipt shows us that this was a union job, which is not at all obvious during this period. We can see that Leon paid his taxes to the union a day after he got his paycheck. Uh, also, this was a band with three musicians in total. Leon was the leader, so he got a few extra bucks, and there was no overtime to be, to be paid. So this just gives us a glimpse into the life of a club date musician in the 50s. I want to move on to the music itself, but I'll say one last thing about the industry. I want to tell you that as the post-war years progressed, the business model gradually changed. It grew in scale, and in a sense, it became more efficient, so that instead of individual band leaders booking for themselves, there were bigger and bigger offices, as they were called, which were essentially commercial partnerships of band leaders who pooled their resources together to get more leads and make more money. The biggest and best known office was Stephen Scott, which started in the late 50s, and they stayed in business for about 50 years. And at their height, in the 70s probably, they could book as many as 20 or 30 events with different bands on a single night. And this shift wasn't just economic, it also had an effect on the music. Like, in some cases, not always, being able to book bands more efficiently meant that the bands were more cohesive and they sounded better. Also, having giant offices that catered to such a wide clientele gave them some flexibility that helped spread certain musical genres much more quickly across the market, like rock and roll in the early 60s and Hasidic popular music in the 70s. So this was primarily an economic shift, but it shaped the musical requirements of the club date business and club date musicians had to adapt and go with the times. Okay, so that's all very interesting, but what was the music? What did they actually play at Jewish weddings? 
These weddings featured a very wide range of traditional and contemporary musical genres coming from both Jewish and non-Jewish origins. This diversity reflected the diversity of American Jews themselves, who had very different musical preferences that were tied with all sorts of factors, religious, cultural, political, and socioeconomic. I'm going to start with a bird's eye view, and then I'll break it down a little bit. So generally speaking, the American Jewish wedding repertoire included four categories. The biggest one, kind of like a typical wedding today, was pop, contemporary North American popular music which basically meant at the time jazz or swing, which could go with any number of dances, and later on rock and roll starting in the late 50s. This music was so common and so dominant that musicians sometimes called it American or even just regular music. The next big group was Latin ballroom dances, which around this time meant primarily rumba, merengue, cha-cha, and mambo. These dances were becoming popular in the US since at least the mid 40s, and they stayed popular for a few decades. American Jews <coughs> were very eager to listen and dance to this music because even though it was you know, part of American popular music, in a sense, it was the exotic other of American pop culture. So consuming it or appropriating it was a way for them to be American, to perform an American identity. It was a path into the mainstream. So a lot of Jews, for instance, took dancing lessons in New York and also famously in the Catskills. And occasionally weddings or other events would feature an entirely separate band of specialist musicians that were hired just to play exclusively Latin music. Next on this list were the so-called ethnic or continental dances that were less common but not rare. These were usually European dances, hence the name continental, like the Italian Tarantella, Viennese Waltz, Hungarian Chardash, or Polish Polkas and Mazurkas. These dances were not a fixed part of the evening, but very often wedding guests would come up to the bandstand and ask for them. So the band had to be ready with at least a couple of tunes in each category. On top of this already very crowded lineup, there was obviously one more important category, and that's Jewish music. In some sense, this was just another ethnic category, one more stylistic departure from the regular American music that added some flavor to the party and addressed the special requirements of the clientele. Usually at most secular Jewish weddings, Jewish music got about the same playing time as other ethnic genres with no more than five or 10 minutes. I don't have any full recordings of secular weddings from this period, but I do have this. This is a recording of a live set in the Catskills from 1967 which I received from Marty Bass, who I'll get back to in just a moment. Uh, and this is the set list. That's what they played that night. And it's pretty similar in its musical profile to a wedding from this period, maybe with a bit more emphasis on Latin music. And you can see this blend of American genres and Latin dances, some continental music, and just one set of Jewish dance music. And this was pretty typical, not a lot of Jewish music. On the other hand, Jewish music had a unique status in this list of repertoires. It was an essential fixed segment of the evening that carried emotional and sometimes religious significance for the families and for their guests, and it was often performed at key moments of the wedding. Now, if this list of genres looks like a lot, that's because it is. The wedding repertoire was very diverse. Every wedding could feature any or all of these genres, and because of the structure of the club date business, musicians had to be very versatile and know at least a few tunes from every genre. We should also remember that during this period, musicians played from memory, and it was very rare to play from sheet music on the bandstand, at least at a wedding. So they weren't just expected to be familiar with the conventions of each of these genres, they had to literally memorize all these memories, uh, all these melodies and know them off by heart. I should also mention that these categories, these repertoires, have pretty blurry edges, and the musical distinctions between them weren't always so clear. So just as an example, some Jewish music could be performed as swing or Latin or rock, and this was pretty common. But despite these overlaps, most of the time when people spoke about Jewish music, they had a pretty clear idea of what they were talking about. And this was usually the fast dance music that would generally go along with Jewish circle dancing, whether that was klezmer or Hasidic or Israeli folk songs. 
The relation between the different repertoires could be very different from one wedding to another, and it depended on a lot of factors. But right now, I'd like to focus on the ratio between Jewish music and everything else, because it can teach us something about the different approaches to Jewish culture and identity during this period. To describe this very complicated network of social factors and musical preferences, and to simplify it a little bit, I used a tool that, <clears throat> sorry, a tool that I learned about from the musicians I've interviewed, and especially from Marty Bass and the late Pete Sokolov, who described the amount of Jewish music at post-war weddings as a range or a spectrum, with one end featuring mostly American music and little to no Jewish music, and the other end featuring exclusively Jewish music. And this, this tool, this spectrum, is very helpful for visualizing the role of Jewish dance music within the wedding repertoire and for mapping out the social and musical landscape of the club date business. This spectrum represents the full range of Jewish wedding music during this period, and we can think of it as a kind of a social musical map in the sense that every Jewish community in New York takes up a spot or a region on this map, each according to their musical taste and their musical needs. Obviously, this map is simplified, but it's a pretty effective way to make sense of this period, and it allows me to show the relationship between a few social factors that shaped the musical landscape. And the ones that I've studied are the level of religiosity, the degree of proximity and attachment to Yiddishkeit, the amount of time that has passed since immigration to America, socioeconomic class, the relationship between generations within the family, and political affiliation. And today, for the sake of time, I'm going to demonstrate with just a couple of these, uh, and I'll start with religiosity, which maybe unsurprisingly was the most influential factor, uh, factor that determined the amount of Jewish music at the wedding. So here you can see a very basic depiction of religiosity on the spectrum. And in this image, the right-hand side of the spectrum, where Jewish music was more dominant, is occupied by religious weddings, where rabbis and other religious authority figures tried to keep the wedding strictly kosher by keeping non-Jewish music off the dance floor. At Hasidic weddings, there would often be exclusively Jewish music, and usually there would be an emphasis on special tunes that were associated with the particular Hasidic sect that the family belonged to. At other Orthodox weddings that were not Hasidic, there could still be at least some American music, and sometimes quite a bit. Um, occasionally, the rabbis would allow it, and at least in some cases, the band would start with Jewish music, wait for the rabbi to leave, and then switch to American dance music, which sometimes also meant mixed gender dancing. I'm going to be focusing today more on the secular side of the spectrum, but I just want to mention a few names here. So some of the famous band leaders from this period who served the Orthodox clientele were people like Yidel Turner, Blazer Klitnik, and Joe King, who all came from within the Orthodox community, but also people like Rudy Teppel, and later on the, the Epstein brothers, who were secular Jews that developed a specialty in this music and in this market. There were even some bands that developed a specialty in the music of one particular Hasidic community, like the Klitnik Ehrlich Band, that was led by the brothers Laser and Meyer Klitnik, alongside Yom Tov Ehrlich, the famous Hasidic composer and writer, and they played primarily for the Stoliner Hasidic community. But for the most part, the Hasidic population in New York at the time was just not big enough. So to make a living, most bands had to play for diverse religious communities or even cross over into the secular market. On the left-hand side of the spectrum were the so-called secular weddings. But of course, secular is a pretty vague label, and there was still a very wide range of religious customs and behaviors. But relative to the other half, these were less observant Jews. <coughs> So these secular weddings were the main source of employment for Jewish wedding musicians in the 50s, and they usually featured an inverse ratio of Jewish to non-Jewish music, where American popular music took up most of the party, and Jewish dance music was really only played for a couple of short segments in the margins. There was still a lot of diversity because Jewish music could fill anything from a few minutes all the way up to a third or even half of the music in some cases. But usually the bottom end of this range was much more common during this period, and most secular weddings only fe featured one set of Jewish dance music that lasted about five or ten minutes. That's why musicians from this generation often called these weddings not secular, but American, because there was a lot more American music. 
Generally speaking, there was a direct relationship between the amount of Jewish music at the wedding and the proximity and level of attachment to Eastern European Jewish culture, or Yiddishkeit. So the further the bridal couple and their families were removed from Yiddishkeit, the less Jewish music would be played at their weddings. Another way of putting it, the more they adapted to mainstream American culture, the more their wedding party was likely to be dominated by swing, rock, and Latin ballroom dances. So let's just look at a couple of factors that shaped this proximity to Yiddishkeit. And one obvious component is the amount of time that had passed since the family immigrated to the United States. The extreme group in this regard were the recent post-war immigrants. Often they were Holocaust survivors who had just arrived from Europe, and they were called in Yiddish the Grine, or the Greenhorns. And here I'm indebted to scholars like Joel Rubin, Henke Snetsky, and Henry Spoznik, who've written about this community in a few places. The Grine were contemporaries, but from a different world, and they were more attuned to recent developments in popular music in Europe than in America. So for instance, they had a clear preference for tangos and waltzes and some other continental repertoire, but alongside this repertoire, they also danced to traditional Yiddish music. And so their arrival in the US gave a temporary boost for klezmer and for American klezmer musicians. For instance, there were some band leaders like Murray Lehrer and Marty Levitt who focused on this clientele. And so they had to have ready at their fingertips a pretty wide repertoire of both continental dances and traditional Yiddish music. And we can really see this in their recordings. The most famous example is Marty Levitt's album from 1968, Marty Goes Continental, where the album cover proudly announces that Marty plays, quote, your favorite songs and dances from Vienna, Budapest, Warsaw, Moscow, Tel Aviv, and other capitals of the world, unquote. Murray Lehrer is a bit less known. I don't have his portrait, and I don't know that much about him, other than that he was an accordionist and that he played quite a bit for the Grine. But he did record a few albums in the 1950s with Dave Tarras, the famous clarinetist, and I want to play you some music. So here is a distinctly continental example. This track is called Old European Waltz Medley, and it's from an LP with Murray Lehrer and Dave Tarras and some other musicians from around 1958. Let's listen. So this is the kind of music you probably could have heard at a wedding of the Irina, recent European immigrants to New York. And I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Miriam Hoffman, who some of you might know as a Yiddish professor, journalist, and playwright. And she told me a bit about her wedding in 1956 with the late Mendel Hoffman, who was also a devout Yiddishist and was actually very active at UVO for many decades. Miriam and Mendel were both Holocaust survivors from Europe. They were both Yiddish speakers, and they were immersed in Yiddishist cultural circles in New York. And thanks to their ties with this community, they were able to hire a band that was led by a pretty unusual, <clears throat> unusual band leader, Lazar Weiner, the respected composer, conductor, and pianist, who was far better known for his work with Yiddish art music, and was generally known to be pretty much against all forms of popular music, Yiddish popular music, American popular music, it didn't matter. But nonetheless, he was the band leader at their wedding, and Miriam told me that the band performed Yiddish music along <coughs> alongside tangos, waltzes, and some American dances, which really fits the, pro the profile I've been showing you. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm thank you to Miriam's son, the actor Avi Hoffman, for helping me arrange this interview with his mother. Um, so moving on, another interesting factor that influenced the attachment to Yiddishkeit was socioeconomic class. According to the musicians I interviewed, wealth was a pretty strong indicator of the amount of Jewish music at a wedding. So for instance, Ray Cohen told me the following. He said, the poorer they were, the more the Jewish influence was prevalent. The more expensive the wedding, the less authentic or important the Jewish music. A wedding at the Pierre or the Waldorf or the St. Regis, you know, the fancy hotels, were mostly for rich Park Avenue Jews to have a really expensive wedding with the finest food, a bigger band, and a budget that allowed the best flowers and everything. The most affluent clientele booked what's known as society orchestras, like the bands of Lester Lannan and Peter Duchin. And while there were plenty of Jewish musicians in these orchestras, 
they usually played non-Jewish events where Jewish music would be practically irrelevant. Occasionally, they did perform at very wealthy Jewish weddings, and then they would play a short set of Jewish dance music with the most basic common tunes, things like Havana Gila, Arzalino, to give the audience an opportunity for some Jewish circle dancing. So on the spectrum, <coughs> these bands fit at the very end on the left. Just below this high society in the social hierarchy were upper middle class Jews who booked bands that specialized in American music, like the bands of Lou Ross and Herb Sherry, or certain band leaders from the Stephen Scott office, like Marty White and Cy Menchin. And actually, Marty White was famous for saying, the more you charge them, the better they think it is, which was probably true. And his bands played primarily American music with just one short set of Jewish dance music. And for the purposes of this clientele, that was more than enough. Here's how Marty Bass, who I mentioned before, the trumpet player, described these weddings. A Marty White band is a Jewish job. It's a Jewish job with modern Jewish people that probably they play Havana Gila and they'd be very satisfied to jump around to a couple of Jewish tunes. And everything else, American. That's a Marty White band. And it just so happens, <coughs> by coincidence, that I interviewed someone who hired Marty White's band for their wedding. This was the wedding of Eleanor and Herbert Poznanski, who got married in the Bronx in 1958. And for their wedding, uh, Marty White brought a six-piece band. And among the dances they performed, Eleanor mentioned Lindy Hop, Jitterbug, and Twist, also Mumbo and Rumba, as well as One Waltz for the older generation. And they also played one medley of Israeli folk songs, during which the couple sat in the center while their guests marched around them in a circle. In contrast to these pretty American weddings, there were also other secular families that put more emphasis on Jewish music. And this also generally corresponded with social class. So for the middle class clientele, there were band leaders like George Paul, Herb Davidson, Marv Kurz, who played at mid-range catering halls. They still played a lot more American music, relatively speaking, but they also played slightly more Jewish music than the previous category, with a more elaborate set or even two sets of Jewish dancing, and occasionally they would also sing some Yiddish songs. So for instance, Marv Kurz, even though he was one of the founders and band leaders of the Stephen Scott office, that usually specialized in American music, he himself was slightly more Yiddish oriented than his colleagues, and he even released a few albums of Yiddish music around this time. And I want to play you a quick example just to give you a taste. Before I do that, I'll just mention that musicians who used to work with him described him as a tumlo, a kind of a crossover performer, MC, and comedian. And they said that he was very charismatic and entertaining as a band leader, which I think will be pretty obvious from this recording. So this is the famous Israeli song, Tsena Tsena, except that Marv Kurz rewrote the lyrics in Yiddish, and he's performing it as Tsena Tsena, the Marv Kurz version, a song about false teeth that keep getting lost. Let's listen to him. Isn't it great? Okay, so next on the spectrum with even more Jewish music was the lower or lower middle class clientele with band leaders like Max Goldberg and later the Epstein brothers who were all completely fluent in traditional klezmer music. The weddings they played usually took place in more modest venues. And even though there was probably still a majority of American dances, they required considerably more Jewish music with two or even three sets of Jewish dancing that often featured traditional Yiddish dances like shares, bulgars, and freilichs. One example of this clientele is the wedding of Helen and Herman Gritz, who were married in the Bronx in 1949. I'm very lucky to have some video footage of their wedding, and that's what I'm showing you right now, even though this video doesn't feature any Jewish circle dancing as far as I can tell. <clears throat> so Helen Gritz, who was born in the Bronx, described her background as lower middle class Jewish. When she was growing up, she was surrounded by Yiddish language, music, and dance, and she passed them on to her children and grandchildren, some of whom still use Yiddish on a regular basis today. 
And this is a great opportunity to thank the Katz Gritz family of Somerville, Massachusetts, who not only set up this interview with Helen for me, but also they've been extremely helpful and supportive to me for years throughout this research process. So Helen Gritz told me that her wedding featured different kinds of American dancing. She mentioned swing and Latin dances alongside plenty of Jewish dances. Like Freilich's Bulgars shares horas with Jewish music taking up about a quarter of the time, which is still not a majority, but a lot more than the previous categories. She also mentioned that the dance floor was very crowded with people from every generation dancing, she and her friends, any children that were present, and everyone from her parents' generation too, men and women, everyone dancing together. And I think that's pretty obvious from this footage. Okay, so putting together all this information about social class and musical taste and different bands, we get something that looks like this. And keep in mind that in terms of religiosity, this is just the left-hand side of the spectrum. So these are the secular or American weddings. And this chart shows us with a bit more gradation and detail how social class affected the amount of Jewish music at post-war weddings and which bands filled these different niches of the Jewish club date business. We don't, have, <coughs> we don't have time today to go through all of the social factors that shaped the musical lineup, but I do want to show you this list one more time and explain that these factors didn't always align socially or musically, and they actually existed in a complicated relationship with each other, sometimes pulling in opposite directions. Finally, I want to explain what this spectrum meant for the musicians. Like I mentioned before, musicians regularly played with different bands, so they needed to be familiar with all the repertoires and be able to play for all or at least most of the sectors of the club date business. Band leaders, however, did tend to specialize in one area of the spectrum, partly because they developed the skill and the repertoire, and partly because they often got their leads through word of mouth and personal connections, so they just tended to become popular within a specific community. And this chart shows you a slightly broader overview of the spectrum, including some factors and bands that I didn't have time to discuss today. And it gives you an idea, <laughs> gives you an idea of just how diverse and multifaceted was the social and musical landscape of this scene. And now I'd like to transition from this very schematic, very simplified view of the music to discuss what this music actually meant for the people who listened to it. And to understand that, we need to take a step back and look at American Jewish weddings from a broader perspective. Because during the first half of the 20th century, these weddings, like a lot of American Jewish culture, changed pretty dramatically. And through this change, Jewish wedding music acquired new meanings and became more important than ever before. To explain this process, I'm going to drop just one academic buzzword here, and that's symbolic ethnicity which is a term that was coined by the American Jewish sociologist, Herbert Gantz, who's written a lot about ethnic cultures in America and in particular about American Jewish culture. So according to Gantz, ethnic immigrant cultures go through a process of acculturation. And over time, they lose some of their defining traits and become more and more like their host societies. In this case, like mainstream American culture. And Gantz talks about a particular stage in this process, which he calls symbolic ethnicity, when many of the older cultural and religious practices fade away, and the ones that remain are less concerned with regulating everyday life and more focused on expressing one's ethnic identity and reinforcing a feeling of belonging to a group. These cultural practices and objects are symbolic of this ethnic identity. They symbolize it, and that's why he calls it symbolic ethnicity. So for instance, for American Jews, one simple example is the rise of kosher style, which happened just around this period. These are food products or services that imitate kosher Jewish cuisine, but don't actually follow the rules of how to prepare or how to consume this food according to halacha, according to Jewish law. And kosher style is a perfect example of this process because everybody recognized it as symbolic of Jewishness, but it didn't actually follow the rules that used to regulate traditional Jewish life. Okay, so during the early post-war period, secular American Jews were shifting towards symbolic ethnicity, and this included their wedding practices. Many of the traditional customs were pretty much abandoned, like going to the mikveh, the ritual bath, or fasting on the day of the wedding. And many other practices were modified or substituted like the chuppah, the wedding canopy, the ketubah, the marriage contract, and the wedding rings. Many families modified these practices. And Jewish wedding music 
it also shifted uh, towards symbolic ethnicity. However, music has a few special characteristics, which I'll explain in a moment, that allowed it to maintain a position of unique importance and stability among Jewish wedding practices. And during the post-war period, when so many wedding rituals had disappeared or changed beyond recognition, Jewish dance music remained an immovable feature of American Jewish weddings. And even though it changed like everything else, there were still surprisingly many continuities with the past. Because of this continuity, music became increasingly important, and it became one of the primary markers of Jewish identity for secular Jews. And even if there was often very little Jewish music, it could never disappear entirely, because it still evoked these strong emotional reactions in American Jews, and the thought of a wedding without any Jewish music at all was nearly unimaginable. Even at the very American end of the spectrum, at a bare minimum, there was at least one set of fast circle dancing with Jewish music, usually a medley of three, four Jewish tunes. This was sometimes called the Simcha dance, and it often came right after the ceremony, either after the groom breaks the glass or shortly after the couple comes out to the dance floor. On many occasions, the bride and groom were lifted in the air on chairs while the crowd danced or walked around them in circles, clapping to the beat of the music. And if you feel that you can easily see before your eyes an image of the scene that I'm describing right now, that's a testament to just how common and iconic this practice has become. And it's also been represented so many times in films and television, and it shows us how Jewish dance music is so strongly associated with American Jewish weddings. So Jewish weddings, uh, Jewish wedding music survived the changes of the post-war period, while many other wedding practices did not. But why? Why music? What's so special about it? And to explain this, I want to return for just a moment to the concept of symbolic ethnicity and say that when this shift towards symbolic ethnicity happens, certain cultural practices are removed from their original context and become stand-ins for the culture as a whole. So for post-war American Jews, this is precisely what happened with Ashkenazi food and with certain holiday customs and with Jewish wedding music, which was especially suitable to carry this weight to become a symbol of Jewishness as a whole for several reasons. First of all, the Jewishness of the music was audible and easy to recognize for most post-war American Jews. And I'm not making, uh, I'm not trying to make an essentialist claim here about what is authentic Jewish music. I'm simply saying that for these people in this time and place, this music sounded very clearly Jewish. Secondly, music was a lot simpler and more approachable than many other Jewish customs. It didn't require any sort of specialized knowledge like religious expertise or linguistic fluency, and it didn't require any serious effort or time commitment. It didn't really interfere with everyday secular life, so it was basically accessible to everyone. <coughs> we should also remember that this was dance music. It's an embodied experience, something that people can connect with through their body on many levels and have fun with it. And many of the testimonies I collected show that, indeed, everyone enjoyed the dancing. And like we saw before, and as you can see in this video, there are young people, elders, there are some children in the background. Everyone wants to join the circle and move their bodies together. So it was an embodied experience. Music also plays uh, a very important role in the maintenance of ethnic identities. Um, there are many studies that show that music can perform these social functions like reinforcing group identity, marking boundaries between different groups, and preserving collective memories. Weddings were a perfect venue for music to accomplish these tasks because they were big public events with lots of music and dancing where families could perform their Jewish identity publicly in front of their extended family and friends. And finally, music is an art form. It's malleable, it's always evolving, and it's able to articulate several aesthetic agendas simultaneously. So this flexibility and hybridity of the music, in this case of Jewish wedding music, allowed it to adapt to new trends in American Jewish culture while still maintaining meaningful continuities with past musical traditions. And the best example here is the popularity of Israeli folk songs in the 50s that blended with klezmer and created a kind of a plasmerized version of Israeli music. And I don't really have time to discuss it today, but I have a whole other chapter of my research about this relationship between klezmer and Israeli folk songs. So if anyone's interested, maybe we can discuss it in the Q&A. The point is that thanks to this aesthetic flexibility, 
Jewish wedding music was able to symbolize a link to the Jewish past without sounding outmoded or obsolete to its listeners. And so it became such a potent symbol of the continuity of Jewish culture. And since it was a secular symbol of continuity, it was especially important for the less observant American Jews who stepped away from the religious aspect of Judaism, but still really valued the secular symbols like music, dance, food, or the Yiddish language. For many of them, these secular Jewish symbols, including Jewish wedding music, were the foundation of their Jewish identity. It was an essential part of their wedding celebration that marked the wedding as Jewish, whether it took up half of the party or just one dance set. And in many of my interviews, when I asked people about the importance of featuring this music at their weddings, they explained it in terms of their Jewish identity and the role that Jewish music played in their upbringing and in their everyday lives. <clears throat> so for instance, Ethel and Yankel Steinberg uh, got married in 1948 in a wedding hall called the Paradine Manor in the Bronx. They had a wedding band that was led by none other than Dave Taras, who played plenty of traditional Yiddish music. And Ethel told me that it was important to have Jewish music at her wedding because, quote, both my husband and I had a Yiddish background. It was just part of our lives, unquote. Or Rose Spivak, <coughs> who was born in Brooklyn, and as a child, she was educated in Yiddish at the Albatering. Rose got married in New York in 1948, and her wedding band, band was led by the trumpet player Harry Kutcher of the famous Kutcher family of Klosmorim. And she even held on to his business card for more than 70 years, which made me especially happy. Rose described the music at her wedding, and she told me that there was basically an even split between Jewish and non-Jewish dances, which is a lot for this period. When I asked her how she felt about featuring Jewish music at her wedding, she told me, plain and simple, I loved it. I'm Yiddish to the core. And many thanks to Marla Spivak for connecting me with her grandmother and getting me this truly amazing quote. And finally, I returned to Helen Gritz. And when I asked her about the importance of Jewish music at her wedding, this is what she said. Jewish music was very much a part of my life. This was as natural to me as breathing to have this kind of music at my wedding. There wasn't anything I had to think about. It was. So to recap, Jewish wedding music persisted through the post-war era, despite tremendous changes to professional structures, wedding practices, and musical repertoires. This was a very partial continuity, and it's important to remember that, but it was a meaningful connection to past Jewish traditions. American Jews, and here I was focusing especially on secular Jews, they consider this music as one of the primary ways to mark their wedding as Jewish and to express their own Jewish cultural identity. Even when they left other rituals behind, they continued to celebrate with Jewish music and dance. And that makes perfect sense. Hiring a band to perform Jewish music and dancing a hora is a lot simpler and it aligns much more smoothly with their secular lifestyle than going to the mikveh or getting kosher catering. And it's still a straightforward way to demonstrate their connection to Jewishness in front of all of their friends and relatives. Of course, there were other wedding customs that endured and some of them were an even stronger demonstration of Jewish tradition, like the wedding ceremony itself and the rabbi at the cantor whenever they were present. But the fact that music was secular and flexible and so accessible to everyone meant that, at least for non-Orthodox Jews, it became a powerful and effective symbol of Jewish ethnic identity. And it secured its place in American Jewish weddings for generations to come. So thank you so much for listening. I'd also like to thank these people and institutions for helping me with this project in so many ways. And before I finish, I'd like to say that this research is still an ongoing project, and I've learned a lot of this from research interviews, as you can see. So if you or anyone you know had a Jewish wedding in New York around the 1950s, I would really love to speak with you. My email is on the screen right now. Please feel free to reach out. So once again, thank you, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Uri. That was a fascinating presentation, um, and you've clearly done so much wonderful research on this topic. It's, uh, it's a treat for all of us to, to get to learn from you. Um, we've got lots of questions, and I'll invite everyone in the audience to please put any questions in um, into the Q&A function. Um, if they go in the chat, we might miss them. Um, before we dive into these questions, just, um, just off the bat, Uri, what um, made you curious to explore this topic? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about how it fits into some of your broader research. Sure. Yeah. So um, I was very curious to learn about 
post-war Jewish culture. I mean, partly for obvious reasons, you know, the, the effects of the war and the tremendous changes that brought to Jewish culture all around the world. But my point of entry into this really was this relationship between Israeli culture and Israeli music and Yiddish culture, Yiddish music, or klezmer in this particular context. Um, because myself as an Israeli who have had for most of my life a complicated relationship with klezmer, and I've really only come to, to know it and to love it in the last few years, um, I've started becoming interested in, in how this sort of dynamic uh, between those two cultures existed and how it affected the, the decades since 1945 and 1948. So I started looking into the relationship between these, these genres and then very quickly, you know, you start talking to wedding musicians, to Klezmorim, they tell you about a lot of other stuff. And I realized that um, the bigger story here really is about, you know, how does Klezmer fit in with Yiddish theater music and with uh, jazz and rock and Latin and all this stuff. And, and then from there, the, the path was pretty short to starting to talk to basically anyone who would speak to me. So that's how I got there. Um, on the topic of kind of like broadly situating this research, a few people are asking questions about why you call this Jewish music rather than Yiddish music and whether or not you've looked at Sephardic um, wedding um, dance music. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So first of all, I should say that uh, I am focusing primarily on Ashkenazi communities, Ashkenazi weddings, which does not mean that everyone in this in this research is strictly identifies as Ashkenazi. Some of the musicians, for instance, don't. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm reading about other communities as well, but I wanted to keep this sort of contained enough so that I feel that I can say something meaningful about it. And other non-Ashkenazi communities often had very different uh, experiences with some similarities, of course. Uh, as to why I'm calling it Jewish as opposed to Yiddish, um, it is because not all of this would fit that neatly into the Yiddish category. I mean, I, I make the argument, I didn't really talk about it today much, but I will make the argument that a lot of the, for instance, Israeli folk music that was coming in the 50s still had very strong ties to Yiddish music. And even when it was trying to escape these ties, um, it was somewhere in the subconscious. And also the musicians that were playing it in New York were bringing these ties back to the back to the surface. So if you hear a recording of someone like Sammy Musiker or the Epsteins playing Havana Gila in 1955, I mean, putting aside the fact that this is actually a Hasidic tune from Sadigura, but if you hear them playing this tune and you compare it to how a band might be playing it in Israel, you'd hear how they bring out these Yiddish elements. Um, but that's an argument that I'm making. So if I just call all of this Yiddish music, I'm essentially uh, effacing all of these very subtle nuances. So I, I talk about Jewish music more broadly. Very interesting. And um, implicit in some of this is language that some of this is sung music, um, or klezmer is an instrumental dance um, genre. So maybe, and some people have questions about this. Maybe you could speak a little bit about, you know, what is the role of the vocalist um, and someone also asks, um, were there ever female vocalists for in non-Orthodox contexts? Yes, absolutely. There were many female vocalists in uh, non-Orthodox contexts. Um, Harriet Kane being a famous one that played with, uh, with uh, Marty Levitt. She was his wife uh, and she was singing and recording with his band for quite a few years. Charlotte Roos is another one. Uh, there were quite a few female vocalists, also some female instrumentalists. Um, I have not yet had the opportunity to speak with any of them. It's very hard to, to find and reach them. So if anyone knows someone, please let me know. But I do have one interview lined up. Um, so the vocalists, uh, for, for Klezmer, essentially, the Klezmer is instrumental music. Uh, there's not a vocalist that's supposed to go with that. But of course, you know, this is, this is an industry. It's a business. People want vocalists. So the bands often did have vocalists. Um, if it was a very small band, it would not have one. But um, there were sometimes there, and they were primarily there to sing uh, the non-traditional Yiddish repertoire. So this would be a lot of the American popular music, the Latin music. Um, as far as Yiddish goes, Yiddish theater melodies that, of course, have a lot of roots and ties to traditional Yiddish music, but especially the way they were performed, they were often going in the direction of swing, jazz, uh, that kind of music, uh, kind of Second Avenue theater music. Um, wondering if there's anything else I should say about the vocalist right now. 
uh, yeah, they were they were singing in different languages. It's it's worth noting, and it's interesting to hear because sometimes they don't have the same kind of facility with all of these different languages. So you can hear someone who's clearly coming from a Yiddish background versus someone who does not, or you can hear how these Israeli folk songs, for instance, are becoming very popular and everybody sings them. But quite often, it doesn't seem that the words really matter that much, so much as it is the sound of Hebrew or something that people perceive to be Hebrew, because sometimes the words are just kind of indecipherable. But it's still interesting to hear how these things come together. Absolutely. Um, and so you talked about um, Klezmer instrumental dance music, about Israeli folk um, music, about Yiddish theater music and Yiddish cabaret music and all these other popular genres. Um, how about the tradition? You, you know, you talked about the tumler, the idea of a tumler a little bit. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that and the connection with um, the badchen? Um, were there, uh, was that a part of weddings during this period or, or, um, or not? Um, so as far as I know, in the secular weddings, they would not hire someone specifically as a badchen. Um, but in a sense, the band leader does fill some of these functions. Um, someone like Marv Kurz, uh, certainly I, I was told he would he would really be entertaining the crowd in many ways. There was some story about him leading a crowd full of people into a swimming pool on some event. I don't know, his charisma apparently. But yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the band leaders were more active, um, especially the ones who were also acting as singers. Sometimes the singer who was not the band leader would be performing this role. They would kind of be the MCs, you know, they would uh, facilitate the different stages of the party, not the ceremony, but the party. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of, of anybody in the secular context that was actually performing Badchonis per se, kind of in line with that tradition, but there was certainly humor in it. There was certainly performance, some theatrical performances. Um, musicians of this generation often refer to it as shtick. Uh, there was a lot of shtick going on, people putting on weird costumes and hats and kind of integrating that into like a very basic choreography with their songs. Uh, this was increasingly happening in the 60s, actually. Yeah, so I think you could make the argument <coughs> that there's a line that goes from um, Badchonis and that sort of role into some of these things, but uh, it remains to be studied a little more closely than I've studied it. Okay, very interesting. So there's a there's a few different questions about the Jewishness or of the of the so-called not Jewish repertoire or how people kind of parse that. Um, one viewer pointed out that the the folk song that you or the sorry excuse me the old European waltz that you played um, from Dave Taras is the same tune as a Russian folk song um, and that uh, she has seen it attributed to um, to Roma um, musicians. Um, do you happen to know the origin of this particular song um, or, or, or maybe, maybe you could speak about this kind of uh, question? Yeah, I mean, first of all, about that particular song, no, I do not. And thank you very much for whoever pointed this out. I'm going to save the chat later and dig into this. Um, but that was that was actually not so much in the in the Jewish category. That was a um, that was one of the continental categories, which. Right. Sometimes there are some. You know, sometimes there are some shared origins, but I mean, if, if this one is a Russian waltz that has some Roma components that actually uh, kind of aligns with this. More broadly, though, like I said, I didn't have time to really go into this, but there are very blurred edges between all of these repertoires, uh, also between the genres. And we know this very well uh, about the history of klezmer more broadly and also, you know, music. There are borrowings from cultures all the time. I think um, Zeb Feldman's book about klezmer does an excellent job at showing all these distinctions between the co-territorial and the cosmopolitan and this and that, all these different uh, repertoires, some of which actually map, map on to some of these categories that I showed today. Um, I, what I'm trying to show though, I'm not really trying to make any claim about what is Jewish and what isn't Jewish. Uh, I don't think it's it's really, it's just not the thing that I'm most interested in in, in discussing and analyzing. I'm, I'm more focused on what people perceived to be Jewish. So Jewish circle dancing, Horas, Freilichs, Bulgars, shares. Of course, many of these were tunes that were borrowed from other cultures, sometimes borrowed from other Jewish cultures. There's also this weird uh, interaction that's happening there. But this was the kind of the, if you think of Jewish music as a category that is this kind of cloud with uh, blurry edges, the Jewish circle dancing is very much in the center of that, of that category for American Jews in the 1950s. 
Um, I could talk about a lot of the blurred edges around, say, jazz. A lot of the famous jazz composers were Jewish composers. And there were certainly instances where people thought about that as something that makes this music more Jewish and it's more appropriate for a Jewish event. Um, similarly, we can talk about, like I mentioned, some of the Second Avenue Yiddish theater tunes. Um, okay, the lyrics were in Yiddish, but oftentimes they were performed very much in a way that was trying to imitate a kind of all American, American mainstream swing jazz sound, but still people, and, and they were not, <laughs> they were not generally part of the Jewish dance set. Usually they were part of the kind of regular dancing, but still if a wedding was trying to be more Jewish in some sense, and this could be shaped by any of the factors that I mentioned, but if for whatever reason, the family wanted it to sound more Jewish, they could say to the band, you know, when you do the American dancing, throw in some more of these Yiddish theater tunes to make it more Jewish. So there, there are a lot of ways in which this is, uh, this is mixed. Not to mention that American klezmer musicians themselves, people like, uh, I mean, the Epsteins and the Musicers are a great example, were people whose playing was also very much influenced by jazz. Sam Musiker is probably the best example in, in this context. And we have, you know, great people today who are continuing this line. Michael Winograd is the best example, in my opinion, of, of really trying to, to tease out these connections between certain idioms of jazz and swing and klezmer and, and see how they fit together and what kind of fusions can happen between them. And this is something that was happening, you know, in the 40s, maybe even before. So certainly in the 50s, there, there, there's a lot of this blurred edges happening. Fascinating. That question was from Amelia Glazer. So if you, in case you want to follow up about the folk song. Um, and Sonia Gollins had a, a sort of a similar question, but I think you kind of touched on it. Um, there were some other questions about um, the Hasidic repertoire. You mentioned that your focus here was more on the secular side of the spectrum, um, but one viewer um, mentions that he, as far as he's um, familiar, Yom Tov Erlech um, played a broader spectrum of Hasidic music, not just the stolen um, Hasidim. Um, and I wonder if you, if you have any thoughts about that or if you have any other thoughts about um, Hasidic weddings uh, that you didn't have time to get into today. Yeah, um, this is a, this is a part of this project that I'm still making some some of my first steps in. So I, I don't want to say much about uh, certainly not about Yom Tov Erlich. There are a lot of uh, far greater experts than me. Um, I will say that uh, maybe this could be interesting for some people that as this period progressed, <clears throat> as the Hasidic population grew and basically there was more work coming from them, uh, they became a bigger component of the club date business. So uh, Jewish wedding musicians who doesn't matter if they were themselves identified as Orthodox or not, religious or not, more and more, if they had any sort of facility with the traditional repertoire, whatever kind, uh, but if they were well-versed in klezmer, they ended up working more and more for Hasidic uh, weddings and for Orthodox weddings because, first of all, there was such a great demand. And secondly, because uh, the secular weddings tended to be on the weekends, whereas the Orthodox weddings would be on weekdays. So this day, this way you could really kind of fill up your calendar if that's something that you wanted to do. And I mean, actually, a lot of these musicians had other day jobs. A lot of them were teachers, especially music teachers. So there was a limit, but still some of them could do 150, 200 jobs a year. And a lot of this came from the Hasidic business. So when we get to the 70s, um, really, whoever's playing klezmer in, in uh, New York as a wedding musician, they're doing this primarily for uh, the Orthodox and especially the Hasidic communities. Of course, things start to change with the klezmer revival or revitalization in the later 70s and the 80s, but that's maybe for another talk. Okay, that kind of dovetails with another question, um, but a few, a few people are asking about the musicians themselves. Um, on the one hand, um, who were these musicians? Um, were they Jewish? Were they themselves secular, religious? Uh, they were perhaps uh, a range. Um, and along those lines, the way that they, um, you know, offered this kind of uh, assessment of the, the range of their clients, do, do you detect um, a kind of value judgment in that? Or is this purely a kind of business model of knowing what customers want, uh, what product? Yeah, uh, just starting with the end, very rarely was there any sort of value judgment. Uh, I think, you know, I, I often had this question that I was a little surprised to hear the answer. I would often ask them, you know, how did you feel about playing this music or playing that music? How did you feel about this change or that change? And I'd often get an answer, something like, you know, whatever, it's a job. I like playing music. I like playing all kinds of music. It's all beautiful. I really didn't 
have uh, an opinion one way or the other. Of course, there are some exceptions to that. Um, but I didn't really detect any kind of value judgment about the clientele themselves and their, their preferences, their taste. It's just, you know, people like different things. Um, sorry, could you remind me the beginning of that question? I had something to refer to there that was important. The, um, the identity of the musicians themselves. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, primarily Jewish musicians worked in the Jewish club date business at this period. However, as far back as anyone I've spoken to can remember, and I think the earliest memories that I had were people who were playing in, say, 1947 and 8, uh, maybe 49. There were always some non-Jewish musicians in the industry. Today, for instance, it's changed a lot. I mean, the whole way this thing works, there's a lot more reading from sheet music. So everything is different today. You could really bring any musician who's a good musician and they could you could put them on the bandstand. They can do a great job. And that is very common. In the 50s, uh, there were some, for instance, Italian musicians working in the business. Um, I, I have a few of their names. I haven't been able to speak with any of them, but it was definitely uh, part of the, of the world. Um, the sort of orthodox, non-orthodox divide was not really existing at the time. So um, Rudy Teppel, for instance, is very famous for playing orthodox weddings. He himself was not an orthodox person. Um, like I said, some of the leaders of the Orthodox business were, but then they might also occasionally play non-Orthodox weddings if, uh, if the business called for it. Of course, not all of them. Um, but there was, there was a lot of going back and forth, and this also meant that a lot of the music was going back and forth. So tunes that were popular in certain Hasidic weddings could also make their way into the secular business and kind of fill the role of the Simcha dance. Uh, although usually they would just play <clears throat> the most common, the most basic, most easily recognizable tunes. And it's not because they're basic is not, again, not a value judgment here. It's just that when you have a crowd that is less familiar with Jewish music, but they still want to dance to Jewish music, you have to give them something that they could latch on to. So you're going to give them something that from the first note, they will know what's happening. They will get up from their seats and they will run to the dance floor. And that's usually in 1955, that's Havan Aguila. Or you know a list of a limited list of about five tunes. So that's that's what they would play. Um, we have so many really great questions. I wish we had time for all of them, but I see we're really already at time here. Um, so maybe just the final question, um, which is, what can you have you published on this topic? Are you planning to publish on this topic? Where can people um, reach more, read more? Where can people follow your your work on this? Um, I have not really published on this topic yet, but I'm working on it very hard. Stay tuned. Um, you can follow me on all the social medias of the world where I am at. And um, yeah, I guess uh, I look forward to sharing more of this work with you in any way possible. Well, thank you so much, Uri. And to answer, some people have asked, yes, this is, has been recorded. It's on Yivo's YouTube channel. You can watch it again. You can share it with your friends. Um, and Uri, thank you so much. We hope to have you back again when there's more research. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks.